Before we read the second scripture, which comes from Genesis, I want to make mention of the name of the title of this homily, The Dance of Fear. There is a dance that we all do with fear every day of our lives, maybe every minute of our lives, where much of it is invisible. A dance that we do inside our own minds as we wonder if we are enough. As we wonder if we're doing the right thing, if we wonder is this what we're supposed to do in church or at home. We do this dance internally as well in our hearts as they are pained when we see something and we wonder and we fear. We do it also in our guts. We feel something deep in our gut when we're fearful. The dance that we do with fear is real. And how we respond to it is also real. And we'll hear an example of how we respond to fear and the ramifications of that. Let us listen to a word from our Lord from the writers of Genesis. This is the 16th chapter. Remember, we are still with Abraham and Sarah. At this point, they are still referred to as Abram and Sarai. They have been with the Lord for 10 years, following God for 10 years when we meet them this morning. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl, though, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go then, go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abraham as a wife. Abram went into Hagar as she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong be done to me, be on you. I gave you my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, your slave girl is in your power. You do to her as you please. And Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, and Hagar ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by the spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to shore. And the angel said to her, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. The angel of the Lord said this also, now you have conceived and bear and shall bear a son and you shall call him Ishmael. For the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all of his kin. So Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, You are Elroy, for she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Berla Haroi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar did bore Abram a son, and Abram named that son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him, Ishmael. This is the word of the Lord. I have always felt sad, would be the word that I would use. I've always felt sad for denominations who say you can't dance. What a limitation on human capability. What a limitation of human creativity. And and I know, I think I know why they say no dancing. There's a fear. Dancing leads to other things, I've heard them say. There's a fear that dancing is too playful, it is too jovial, it is too exciting. And we Christians, we are a serious bunch. We are not to be dancing and to be playful and to be jovial. I'm sure there are other fears as to why you cannot dance. 
I'm sad for them because those folks have never felt the crumple in their stomach that is a mess of butterflies, anxiety, wonder, nervousness, and everything else as you contemplate whether or not to ask her to dance or if he's going to ask you to dance. They have also never experienced the ecstasy described by King David that is in our scriptures when he felt the presence of the Lord and he stood on a table and he danced for everyone there. He could not help but dance. They've missed all of this to dance. Friends, I still remember eighth grade at Fisher Middle School in Los Gatos, California. It was an October day like yesterday, like any other day. I was still new to the school even though I had been there a year. But I was that hick from Tennessee, the guy who probably did more cow tipping than he did getting an education is the way they understood me out west. But we were at a dance, and I was about to make a name for myself. I was standing on that wall. Do you guys have those walls when you were at dances? The guy wall and the girl wall? The safety walls, as we used to call them? Fearlessness compelled me to take my life into my own hands, and I stepped away from the guy wall, and I ventured out into no man's land. That was the actual dance floor where no one else was, and I was going to ask Kelly to dance. And I took some really bold three steps. I got to the middle of the dance floor. I knew where she was and I took a hard right and I ran to the drink table to grab a Coke and let my blushing face recover. I never made it. I never made it across the dance floor. Last week I shared that for the next three weeks, this week being the middle week, we were gonna talk about an ancient meditative practice where we try to contemplate and finish three phrases. Last week was I want, this week is I fear, and next Sunday is I surrender. I fear. That's the phrase we're going to call to finish today. I fear we are afraid to dance. Maybe it's a fear that we're going to pick the wrong partner and have to commit to them for a lifetime. Maybe it's a fear of not being good dancers and that we're going to step on someone's toes. It hurts to have your toes stepped on, doesn't it? Or or maybe it's a fear that the one with whom you want to dance doesn't want to dance with you. There's a fear of rejection. Or maybe, like I was in eighth grade and probably you were too, there's safety on those walls, is there not? There is safety over on the guy's wall and the girl's wall. Your back is protected. You can't embarrass yourself. But when God called Abram and Sarah, who would become Abraham and Sarah, God called them to a new life. And God gave them one promise. And that promise would be fulfilled when they had a child. You will be the mother and the father of a new nation. And when you have a child, that will be a fulfillment of that promise. And then that child will carry the promise forward. But that hasn't happened. It's been 10 years. Imagine 10 years out in the wilderness, 10 years of following God with only a promise, and you're 75 years old when you start this promise that involves having a child 75 years young. And so Abram and Sarai are tired. They are tired waiting for a promise to come to fruition when we meet them this morning. How many of you have waited for a doctor to call back? How many of you have waited for a significant other to call back after you've texted to say, are you okay? How many of you have waited for a bank to call you back to get a loan or the town to call you back because you have an overdue payment? To wait is to linger in the unknown. And I don't know about you, but I fear the unknown because it's, well, it's unknown. So we grab fate or the future or God or whatever it is that's standing in our way and we seize it and we take control and we say to our husband like Sarah did, you will have a baby, it will be ours, I'll give you my servant girl Hagar. We are going to dance because God promised us a dance. And I love her intention. Because they were honest. They were honest in the fact that I don't think she wanted the promise to die. 
She didn't want the promise to fail. God had given them one of the greatest tasks known to humanity at this point and ever since, and she did not want it to come to fruition. I like to think that her heart was in the right place when she devised an amazing and I think pretty ingenious plan and then implemented it. Her only problem was that it was done out of fear, a fear we all know. The promise is taking too long. The weight is too much to bear. I need that son. I need God's promise to come true. And as soon as it happened, she knew it was wrong immediately. From the minute Hagar was pregnant, it was wrong. She knew this is bad. Her worst fears were realized. And maybe at that moment, she felt inferior to a slave girl. Maybe she wondered if she even mattered anymore, if she was going to get thrown out of camp because all God promised was a child. And I bet maybe she wondered if the life that they gave up was really worth giving up. Abram, why'd you do this to us? This promise has never been fulfilled. Sarai is a beautiful example of how we dance with fear. We twirl it. We dip it. We do the box step. If you're fancy, you do the waltz or the salsa. You attempt to tame it. You say it's not there. I don't fear anything. Yeah, you do. You just don't want to admit it. The best way we know how to do it is to control it. And so we use our words to seize control of what is fear. Just listen to the news. Listen to what's coming out of our own mouths. How we are lamb blasting others while we cheer our own. No wonder we fear dancing. The safety of the walls is safer than getting out into the dance floor. Lobbing bombs at one another across the dance floor is easier than it is to leave and to step out in faith. Sarai wanted to believe that God had this plan, but it was taking too long. And so she took her hands and created a new one. And we have got to give her thanks for her initiative. The only problem was it was her own plan, and it had ramifications. And that's some of our fears, I would imagine, many of them stem from our fear of God. Our fear that God's not listening. Our fear that God doesn't care. Our fear that God might be done with us. But friends, those fears are not true. We're called to dance with those. I don't want to say that they're not real, but they are not true. No matter what, know this. God's right there with you in your fears. God was right there with Sarai and Abram when they were fearful that this was not going to actually happen. God said, I will dance and I will continue to dance with you all. In a season of stewardship, when you're being asked to give from your abundance... There's still fear involved. Do I have enough? Is it worth it? Do they need it? Yes, to answer all of those. Whenever you finish the statement, I fear, I want you to put a comma and say, but God is with me. Whatever it is that you fear is real, but God is with you. I thought about what I fear all week long as I read this story, and and I fear similar things that Sarah does, wondering if God's promises will come true, wondering, doubting sometimes, being real. And I clicked on a friend's homily that he was preaching, and the title of it was The Kids Are Watching. And about halfway through, he changed the title of his homily from the kids, as if they are those kids away from us, to our kids are watching. Our kids are listening to us. Our kids are taking notes on the actions that we do or don't do. Our kids are watching us, like we watched Sarai and Abram. So dance. Dance, please, because if you're going to move beyond where we are together, we're going to have to dance with one another. We are going to have to leave the walls of safety 
whether they are guys and girls, traditions and contemporary, Republicans and Democrats, whatever the walls are, we have to leave them and step out in faith to trust that God is there. And trust me, friends, God's there. Leave your comfortable spot and dance. Be bold and ask someone to dance with you and trust that God will be right there with you because God is faithful. Sarai took the initiative and changed the plan. But that change became engulfed into God's plan. Hagar and Ishmael become a part of the plan because God's dance floor is big enough for all the bumps that we put into the road. So dance. You are called to dance, and that means you're going to step on someone's toes every so often. Dance, because you're going to forget the dance moves, and that's okay, and you're going to get embarrassed. But trust me, if an 8th grade Ben can get over it, you can too. We're going to think the dance floor is made for just yourself, and you're going to run into other people, but that is part of the dance, friends. Do you see why I feel bad for denominations that don't let you dance? (laughs) Not only is it a limitation on human capabilities and human creativity, but it's a limitation on the exercise of overcoming human fear. Maybe I shouldn't say overcoming it, but dancing with it. I know y'all have been thinking about this the whole time I've been preaching. I did eventually dance with Kelly. I stood over at the drink table for about four songs because that's how long it took for the blush to get out of my face and the embarrassment to leave me. I drank three Cokes in that time period. She came over. Apparently, she wanted to dance with me, which was wonderful. And she said, oh, did you notice how wonderful the dance floor looks three times? And finally, I took the hint. I think it was the best dance she's ever had, if if you ask me. Sometimes we need a hint. Sometimes we want to step out boldly from the walls and and do it all on ourselves. But whether it is boldly stepping out alone or getting a hint, dance. Dance with the Lord and with one another, even though we are full of fear sometimes. Because the Lord is in that fear. Thanks be to God. Amen.